I've always been taught in these kinds of events, especially when you have not had a break for a long time, <laughs> and nature might be beckoning to stand up to be heard and speak up to uh, stand up to be seen, speak up to be heard, and to sit down to be appreciated. <laughs> so I shall be mercifully prepared. As I was sitting here, I was looking at your sign. Building a science bridge between U.S. and Turkey, Turkish American scientists and scholars. We are a hyphenated nation. Turkish Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, African Americans, I myself happen to be a Latino Asian American. Born in China, raised in Peru, came to this country at the age of 15 to learn English and ended up being a college president. That is why I think it is very important to note the bridge between Turkey and the United States. We are very similar. We are both multicultural nations. We are both melting pots. Turkey in this serving as a geographical and cultural bridge between Europe and Asia, a modern secular democracy with one of the fastest growing economies in the world, and we United States being a nation of nations, perhaps the first truly universal nation in history, a nation that is made of immigrants. 20% of all Nobel Prize winners in the United States were born abroad. So I am privileged and honored to welcome all of you to the University of Maryland on behalf of all the faculty and students, including 80 students from Turkey, including 20 faculty members who have gotten their PhDs from Turkish universities. Welcome to the University of Maryland. The special dignitaries, His, Excell His Excellency, the ambassador from uh, Turkey. There you are. <laughs> to going to your reception this evening, meeting a trillion guests <laughs> who that you will serve. Uh, and Mr. Ambassador, I read your remarks in response to that governor from that state in the south, we shall not be mentioned, <laughs> who was uh, for a short time a candidate for the Republican nomination for president. And his idiotic remarks about uh, Turkey. Well, I'm, and of course you are a lawyer, I'm a lawyer, so please, no lawyer jokes. <laughs> but you were a model of restraint and diplomacy when you said that he was simply missing for him. So it is so misinformed, of course, that he left the race for the Republican presidential nomination. So thank you for your remarks, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, the Deputy Minister for Science, Industry, and Technology is here. There you go. Uh, okay. You have to go on the break. Yeah. <laughs> um, president of the Higher Education Council. There you are. Nice to meet you. Uh, I had an occasion to uh, go to your website. After all, I wanted to know, you know who I was uh, meeting with. And, and, and also, I'm just thrilled that there are some 20 presidents, or rectors, I guess you call them, rectors, vice rectors of Turkish universities. And um, it, it's really quite remarkable, because that is what, to have 20 of you present here, that is, more than 10% of all the vice, all the, all the presidents of Turkish universities. Now, while I was in your website, I chanced to read, and I was absolutely enthralled, you know, and I read it late, late at night. Usually I like to read something to help me go to sleep, but this instead kept me awake. <laughs> <laughs> this was a speech by President Erdogan addressing the International Congress of Higher Education in Turkey. And the key point that I remember saying 
is that higher education in Turkey, which is expanding dramatically. I had no idea that 30 years ago there were maybe, what, 30, 40 universities, and now there are over 140 state institutions plus another 40 or so foundation institutions. Dramatic growth. And he was saying how important higher education is for the future of Turkey. But there was something else he said. It is not simply a passport for economic opportunity, for pur purposes of personal advancement. He said, Turkish universities, and I believe all of higher education anywhere in the world, should be for the causes of justice and of development. Because as I was hearing the presentations today, what was going through my mind about the importance of science and the role of science in advising government, I was reminded of the words of President Teddy Roosevelt. To educate a person in science, but not in morals, is to educate a menace to society. So it is not just about the acquisition of knowledge and skills in doing research, but to give back that knowledge to the causes of justice, social and economic justice and compassion and mercy in a world that's greatly in need of these blessings. So I resonated to that vision of higher education that was communicated by President Wu. But let me just very briefly focus on and I know we have a break. I need to go for a break as well. But his emphasis on development. You know, I'm greatly honored to have 20 university presidents and vice presidents for Turkey. A week ago, I welcomed about 15 presidents from Iraq. Uh, Three or four months ago, I welcomed some 20 presidents from India to come to the University of Maryland, and about a year ago, several presidents from China. What do they have in common? So I learned that you have dramatically increased the number of universities in Turkey, and you want to elevate them to the next level in the context of the Bologna process. I learned from the Indian presidents that India plans to create 1,000 universities over the next 10 years. And they came here to see what we can learn, what they can learn from us. And I said, it's the other way around. What can we learn from you? China is creating four to five universities a year for the next 10 years. Higher education is more important than ever. And the reason it's more important is because of the linkage, as President Wu has said, to develop. We are in a globally networked universe. And in a global university where in a knowledge economy, higher education is absolutely essential. So the two major mega trends that I see, and they were clearly intimated in the speech of President Wu. It is a global world that we're in. Universities have to be globally networked. And number two, it is not enough simply to be research universities. We have to be innovation and entrepreneurial universities. And let me just say just a brief word about the two of them. In terms of a globally networked university, we are in the midst of a global ring race. Very recently, I had lunch with the president of the National Science Foundation. He's from India originally. He came about 25 years ago, graduate of the Institute of Technology in Mumbai. There were 175 graduates in his class, and he said 150 came to the United States to get their PhDs. I'm one of them. And he became dean of science at MIT, and then uh, is now uh, the head of NSF. He said, I went back to Mumbai to give the commencement address. And there were still 175 students and I said, raise your hands. How many of you plan to come to the United States? Remember, when he graduated 25 years ago, 150K. 25. That tells you something. It used to be that all the people from China would stay in the United States. Most of them are going back. There is a brain circulation. It's no longer a matter of, of brain drain. We are in collaboration and competition. I think the watchword is not just collaboration, that is exchanges. We are collaborating and we are competing. It's a word of collaboration. 
And I think competition is good. It brings out the best of us. So we are in collaboration and in competition for the best minds of the 21st century. And those minds will travel across national boundaries. We are increasingly becoming universities without boundaries. And I believe that's what's happening in Turkey, or will be happening in Turkey, and that's what will be happening in the United States. Now, since the middle of the 20th century, we've developed in this country the so-called research university. Well, that's a misnomer. We've always had some research. But what we really mean by the research university, we're the federal grant university. Research funded by grants from the federal government. But in the 21st century, I think it is not enough to have just research. We have to translate that research into new products, new processes, to make things that are either better or cheaper or both. Because you know what is the major issue of the 21st century, at least in my view? I saw that uh, in the New York Times a few months ago. There was this young woman for the Occupy movement. And we have had the equivalent of occupied movements throughout the world. You know, not just in the Eurozone and Spain and Greece, United States and elsewhere. This woman was standing there with a sign. And it said, young, educated, unemployed. 20% of all the graduates in China have no jobs. The biggest challenge is what I call eye to eye, ideas to impact. It is not enough for us to be an ivory power. Think of these wonderful <coughs> ideas in the sciences, in the humanities, in the arts. We must convert those ideas to impact for society and the economy. I welcome you to the University of Maryland. I look forward to meeting many of you in this conference, if not in this conference, certainly this evening, walking around the halls of your embassy, which I understand is a replica of Ottoman architecture with magnificent art and a hopefully also wonderful conversation. Thank you for coming here.